Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining me. Now today I'm going to be discussing some of the, the, the important issues around sustainability and ESG in the tax efficient capital, uh, the growth capital world with um, two of the senior women from Jensen Funding Partners. So I'm pleased to be joined by um, the CEO and one of their co-founders, Sarah Barbara, and her colleague, portfolio manager, Lisa Matthews, who was with us on a recent um, Advisor Hour programme. Uh, ladies, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for having us. Now, let's get into the sort of questions. Um, you know, how much are sort of ESG principles a part of the way uh, Jensen Fund and Partners uh, invests? Thanks, Lawrence. So um, ESG principles are incredibly, incredibly important. And while still a relatively new concept, we do believe they've been in, embedded since the inception of uh, Jensen into the way we invest. Um, taking an ESG approach to investing does mean that an investor will take an environmental, social and governance criteria into account when they're considering investing in an asset. Uh, they may have some kind of focus on companies that are seeking to have positive impact on society and the physical environment. But they may not have that as an explicit aim um, and rather adopt a do no harm principle to minimising risk for investors by investing in more responsibly run companies with a greater likelihood of succeeding in the long run. Now, some of our audience are probably familiar with UNPRI, so United Nations Principles of Responsible Investing. I mean, for those who are not particularly familiar, kind of what are they and perhaps why are they important from a broader investment perspective? So the UN's PRI um, principles allow your organisation to publicly demonstrate its commitment to including uh, ESG factors in investment decision making and ownership. Um, there's six guiding principles. Um, did, did you want me to go through what the six are? Yep. So um, the, the six uh, principles are to incorporate ESG issues into investment analysis and decision making processes, to be active owners and incorporate ESG issues into our ownership policies and practices, to seek appropriate disclosure on ESG issues um, by the entities in which we um, invest, to promote acceptance and implementation of the principles within the investment industry, uh, to work together to enhance our effectiveness in implementing the principles and to report on our activities and progress towards implementing the principles. Now, for a firm to be a signatory to the UNPRI, um, what does it actually have to do? I mean, the, you know, you outlined the sort of six principles there. I'm assuming it's a bit more than saying, yes, we abide by them. You've got to do things. And, and then how does that kind of um, work on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, in terms of the culture of the business? Yeah, so just to be clear, we're not actually a signatory to um, the UNPRI, we, but we do align ourselves to those principles. Um, so to make sure that you continue to be a signatory, um, we believe that this is a process of annual review. Um, and the three requirements are having an investment policy that covers the firm's responsible investment approach, covering 50% of the assets under management, um, having internal and external staff responsible for implementing responsible investment policies, and senior level commitment and accountability mechanisms for responsible investment. Um, and I suppose it's important to note that as much as we're not... Um, a signatory, we, we really do align ourselves to all of those sort of th those principles um, and, uh, you, you know, try and keep up um, with those uh, sort of three review processes. And as you say, you're not officially a signatory, but you align the business very much with the principles. And one of those, as you mentioned earlier, was this sort of reporting um, on an annual basis. So does the firm produce something that, that could be described as a kind of annual impact report or, or uh, an equivalent? So um, I'll, I'll take that one, Lawrence. So um, Jensen, we run generalist funds. Um, and so in, in that sense, we, we don't uh, uh, run products which have a specific impact as an objective, um, but we have the ESG principles incorporated into how we make investment decisions. So as a generalist fund, we don't produce an annual impact report, but these are much more common if you um, are an impact-led fund or you run an impact product. 
that's explicitly targeting a particular um, sustainable or, or social outcome. Having said all of that, this is a really evolving area. So we're always keeping an eye on sort of the best practice in terms of ESG and impact reporting. And we participate in the, a few different industry initiatives, sort of working groups trying to develop those frameworks. Um, and part of that is around really making sure how we can properly work with our underlying companies to monitor and report in a meaningful way as a generalist fund, you know, what's the, the important metrics for different companies across different sectors will be different. And so you've got to make sure that when you roll all of that up in a reporting process, it, it has meaning and, and people can, can, can find that information useful. Um, within our portfolio, we do have some impact led companies who have an explicit um, sustainability or ESG impact they're trying to drive and they do produce um, impact reports and that's that's really fantastic and so so we share those as well. Now I know diversity is 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 kind of one of the uh, the elements that you talk about the way the way you sort of invest what what is um, what, you know why is that important and what does it kind of look like in practice for you as a firm? Um, so we we believe it's important because um, of the underlying deal flow that we are ultimately able to attract. Um, investment founders need to feel comfortable with the team that they're going to be working with and receiving investment from. Um, and I think our team page demonstrates uh, a different look and feel um, from, from other funds. And I think through that, we've attracted um, a, a diverse deal flow set. Um, in terms of what does that look like for Jensen, uh, we had um, an intern come in over the summer and she did some research for us um, and through that research she was actually rather devastated because uh, we'd invested in 18% female founders. When we looked at the deal flow um, that had come through over the last three years actually 18% um, who had actually applied were female founders so we were very proportionate to um, the level that was coming in and I think that devastation comes from the the lack of diversity that, that is actually applying to um, for investment but ultimately we were delighted because 18 percent is a great number um, and and that's you know something that we we really want to work on going forward and then just following on from that is the, 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 what do you think can create a sort of more diverse group of people who approach sort of, you know, um, tax efficient firms like yourselves. Um, is, is, is perhaps is there a broader perception issue, do you think, that the industry has? What can what can move the dial on this as an issue? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, and I, I th there isn't one single answer to that, I don't think. I think there is a multitude of um, approaches that we as investors need to take to tackle this issue and ultimately it's going to be about widening um the the, the sort of the pool that we are all looking to um, attract deal flow from and so going to different places different types of universities different um i don't know business areas different accelerators and just making sure we are sort of widening that pool but I, I do think it is very important in terms of um, the founders to feel comfortable um, with the people that they're engaging with and making sure that they feel comfortable coming to you for that investment. <clears throat> Now, I think as investors, we're all kind of used to some of the, the, the big analytics businesses that shine a sort of an ESG lens on, on publicly quoted businesses. Um, it would seem to me it's, that's a little bit harder to apply to um, sort of early stage growth capital type businesses. So are the traditional assessments of ESG kind of harder to apply in, in this part of the investment universe, do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, this is a really important point to recognise, you know, we're talking about early stage businesses that are often small teams, limited resources, they won't be as mature in terms of their processes and systems as later stage or, or larger companies. Um, but I think the other way to look at that, though, is that it's really an opportunity as well, because that is the ideal point in a company's trajectory to really start embedding those ethical and sustainable principles into the core of the business at an early stage. It's much harder and less successful to try and retrofit that kind of cultural um, value set later on. 
And so that's where some of our work with industry initiatives like Venture ESG comes into play, because the point of one of those working groups is to establish what are frameworks that we can work with our portfolio companies on that are suitable and proportional to different business stages. And so you would look at identifying for the stage of the business, which are the which are the um, the first early wins and the first principles to embed. And then as the company grows, how do you mature that and broaden that and deepen it? Um, and together as an industry, keep pushing forward what good practice looks like across different business stages. Lovely, thanks for that. Now, one of the challenges advisors have nowadays or will do going forward is to sort of almost um, kind of figure out what the kind of ESG credentials of, of fund managers um, is particularly in this space um how would you um sort of suggest that they kind of look at that given it is quite hard to apply the kind of more traditional esg sort of assessments to this part of the market yeah it's an interesting question again because uh, there isn't actually at currently um a standard that any fund manager has to adhere to uh, the cfa institute global disclosure standards are the first step uh, we think in trying to standardize disclosures so that advisors and investors can make uh, those informed choices um, and mitigate against uh, what, what's called ESG washing. Um, but this is still early days in getting these agreed. So the onus is on the fund manager to essentially talk about this as part of their messaging to investors. Um, some investors will want to understand the considerations made by the fund manager in their investment process, but also their participation in industry frameworks such as um, the PRI or others might have a particular impact they want their investment to be. So it's not really for us to determine, I think at this stage, what this looks like, but we at, at Jensen have um, a clear statement when asked what our ESG policy is. We've got a page on our website, which is being updated constantly um, as we adapt and improve our own policies. You know, this is, this is an evolving thing. Um, and, but more importantly, we ensure that for our founders, we're demonstrating within Jensen our commitment to ESG so that we're practicing what we preach. Thank you for that, Sarah. And as you say, it's very noticeable when you look at your website, the sort of uh, the diversity of faces that you see on that website compared to perhaps some of the other um, groups in the sector. And just following on from this kind of issue, um, do, do you have any sort of thoughts about how advisors can perhaps match the the portfolios, the investee companies with, with some of their own clients sort of ESG views. It sort of always kind of strikes me with this space that, you know, you start with a client and he or she has to be, you know, a high net worth individual or, or, or professional investor and then applying another level of um, that person's kind of ESG views. It makes quite a complicated sort of challenge, yeah. doesn't it, for an advisor? It does, it does. And I think um, our experience to date would... Um, we sort of speak very much to that complexity and that often you know clients will ask their advisor if they have particular ESG or sustainable uh, preferences for investing but um, that is still very much just part of the um, advisor client relationship and and those conversations around the priorities that the investor has but it still seems to be that the ESG lens is more of like an opt-in rather than a default currently. So very much that's to do with, you know, exploring in that relationship, having those conversations around um, the client's priorities um, and preferences, but also really sort of exploring what they mean by those preferences. You know, what does sustainability mean to them? Um, or do they have a particular impact that, you know, they want their investment to have? So still very much relationship based as opposed to kind of standardised or questionnaire based at the moment is what we see. I think some of the, um, the new disclosure standards that are being, you know, worked up and gradually published will be a really important step in at least kind of harmonising the language that we can use around this space. So it'd be a good idea to sort of keep abreast of of those standards as they start coming out, coming into force. Lovely, thanks for that. Now, as I think you've both said already, I mean, sustainability is only one sort of element of, of, um, of what Jensen looks for in, in, in companies it's going to invest in. I think kind of more, more my broad question here is, you, you know, why, why at the moment do you feel that the SEIS and the EIS space is such an exciting area for, 
for people to be invested in. So, yeah, the early stage growth market uh, is such an exciting space because of the variety of innovation and ultimately the solutions um, to problems um, and how they're tackled. As to whether UK businesses can solve um, global problems, why, why not? <laughs> why wouldn't they be able to? Um, one of the biggest problems that UK businesses face is uh, is the lumpness in, I think, do it going through the, the funding process. Um, and, um, and much of that time is spent looking for further funds rather than actually growing the business. So, you know, this is something, again, that we're trying to tackle. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you've got anything you'd like to add to that. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, when I think about, you know, these really big global challenges and A, the role of UK business, but the role in particular of the tax efficient funding space in this, you know, they, this is a significant level of innovation that we are all going to need to come together to, to develop and bring to, to scale to have impact and tackle these really important problems. And I think when you look at the um, the funding landscape, the tax efficient space plays a really important part in the journey of those innovations. And I think also being in the UK, you know, it's such a fantastic talent pool and research base that where these innovations can, can come out of. So as well as the, you know, the tax efficient support through UK regulation, there's also some, you know, really mature innovation funding um, and incredible research universities, which spin out the talent needed to bring these innovations to market. And so, you know, I think it's a really exciting, exciting place to be. Well, it would be great to think um, that um, something that begins to solve some of these kind of big climate problems and, and broader uh, kind of global problems can come out of the UK. I guess the, to your point, Sarah, sort of what, why not? You know, nobody's got a monopoly on sort of bright ideas. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for your time, both of you. Really enjoyed it. If anybody wants to know more about Jensen Funding Partners, obviously you can uh, find the information uh, on the group's website, as uh, Sarah mentioned earlier. Or if you want to know anything about the individual kind of EIS or SEIS portfolios they have available, they're there as well. But they're also on the Growth Invest platform. But for now, ladies, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Lawrence.